moving over to Amalia, and, and I think as a as a good segue from the previous question and, and discussion, some of the frustrations that are experienced by organizations that are uh, breached and some of the challenges that are seen by organizations that are doing training or are trying to fine tune the training to their own corporate culture have to do with the specificity of that training because just saying hey you know what it's it's personal information protect it uh try to protect it as if it were your own uh, i do agree with with david that in many cases leaders um don't really understand when data becomes personal data and when personal data becomes private uh, and so th those examples are one thing but the metrics that need to be put in place in order to quantify the risk are quite another. What are some of those um, actionable strategies that can be put in place in order to make the, the efforts towards privacy awareness or even security awareness measurable, but also have some sort of hope to improve year over year? Amalia, what do you see in that space? So I want to pick up um, where, where David left off, and I mm -hmm. want to say that what we need to understand is the dynamics of companies these days. People leave after a year, a year and a half, three years. So it is impossible to maintain a certain level of understanding what you need to protect when, uh, what are the requirements when you collect the data, but then how do you use it, and so on. So I'm going to go back to what I said a bit earlier. Uh, we need to educate the boards as much as we educate them about cybersecurity. That's privacy is the other side of the coin. If they only know about cybersecurity, that, that's just half. Absolutely, 100% just half. Um, we need to educate them why. We need to educate them how it's going to hit their business objectives if they don't do it. And then we need their support to embed it in layers. That is the only way it's scalable and measurable. And to Michael's point, which is again, fantastic. It's put some KPIs. I mean, I, I worked in big pharma over 10 years ago. I was, well, I was there 15, 17 before that, but we actually had um, measurable in our HR documentation. We had uh, key performance indicators that were linked to the company objectives. And because I was in the privacy role, my privacy objectives had to be linked to that. So measure people actionable, measure people on how they perform and conform, link to their job. So embed that into their job. And of course, then create the layers, the proper layers of, of governance controls uh, in the organization to catch uh, privacy from a, all the way from governance to to operations. Excellent. Um, so again, uh, as a segue from that to the challenges that we're seeing with, with training and the effect of training on organizations, the reason why seems to be floating around a lot. Why am I learning this? Why are we training people? Why does this matter? Why does this much data not matter, but this much data matters, et cetera. Um, Brent, how do you deal with the issue of accountability? Because ultimately people need to feel like they're responsible for something and then they perk up. Uh, how do uh, operational roles differ from management roles when it comes to the perception of responsibility and accountability? Well, nothing focuses people's attention, like say, like somebody like me or David swooping in and saying, yeah, you're going to get sued over this and you're going to have to testify and explain what you did. Uh, it's not an approach I recommend for everything and it's not a proactive approach, uh, but uh, certainly understanding consequences uh, is a big part of it. Uh, a lot of this really comes down to developing a privacy focused culture. Um, and yes, I mean, the accountability of a rank and file employee who's doing intake uh, and you know is making minimum wage and is probably going to be gone for after a year. It's going to be always a challenge to bring home to them that, look, this is, you know, you are part of an organization, that organization has duties to people, you have, you know, we're all one team and we all have to be part of this. 
um, all you can really sort of do is appeal to their better nature and also give them to understand that if you're not, <laughs> if you're not, be, I mean, to, to Amalia's part, I should be able to tell as an organization that's doing the testing, if this person is repeatedly flunking the test, I should not be putting them in a position where they're dealing with sensitive data. Uh, I'm moving them to the loading docks. Uh, so they should understand you may not get to have the job you want here if you're not taking this seriously. Um, now, as you move up through the organization, it's a different story, right? I mean, and very often I'm dealing with companies where, um, you know, they're small or mid-sized companies where the management and the people that are the, the, the uh, sitting on the board are the ones that are, you know, they, they are very personally invested in the success, the success of the business. It's their life. It's the livelihoods. And so they are easier to focus on on uh, on these problems uh bigger organizations where your directors are appointees uh you know it's a retirement gig for them it's a little harder to make them uh you know, to, to engage them in quite the same way but one of the struggles that we've had for years now and it's an ongoing one is making uh, boards of directors understand that the this the buck stops with them it's not enough for them to just delegate and say we have guys that are uh, dealing with this they need to understand them um, and increasingly, I think we're going to see courts and, and regulators, and this is part of how I bring this home to clients, is to say, look, every year that goes by, every breach that happens that ends up in a court or in front of a privacy regulator, the list of things that are expected of you gets longer, and the excuses for not knowing about these things dwindle because it's publicly, it's publicly available, right? And anyone who's paying attention or talking to their lawyers will know about these things. So it's the, like the table stakes get higher every year. Uh, so a lot of it is just bringing home to the board. It's not enough for you to be able to say, I've got a department dealing with this. I've even got a CISO dealing with this. You need to be able to talk to that person intelligently about what's happening. You need to understand. You need to be able to explain it to your fellow board members if they don't seem to be taking it seriously. Uh, so I'm fixating a bit at that level at the top because I think that's sometimes where, um, you know, a lot of these things you have to start at the top because people lead by example, right? And you're never going to have a culture uh, that takes this seriously if you can't impress that upon the people at the top. Mm -hmm. It doesn't answer yeah. the question, but it answers a question, I'm sure. Well, it's about crystallizing the reality in the minds of, of, of people where we're talking about a reality that's changing much faster than it did 20 years ago. I mean, we're talking on an, about an annual acceleration in these types of events, and uh, breaches are certainly felt a lot in the wallets of insurance companies. So, so Michael, from the perspective of bringing this home to, um, I want to say, boards of directors or managers, et cetera, does the insurance sector, is there a, a scenario in which there would be a breach and upon investigation, it turns out that an organization had completely inadequate education, knowledge transfer, training from the perspective of protecting personal information or whatever sensitive assets were lost. Is there any risk there for organizations to not have their breach costs covered by their cyber policy? The only time that's going to be a problem is, you know, if you set on an application that we do training of our employees right you know on the bottom of all these applications is a warranty statement that basically says you know if you lied on any of these questions then there's the potential that there's that we're not going to respond to a claim mm -hmm. um but i would say that the it's probably less of a risk because most organizations like we've talked about do some level of training and it, and they and there's no question where they can really measure to what degree that training is really done to well that's not to say it can't be there there are tools you can use out there to measure the you know how broadly it's being done its effectiveness etc but the bigger issue comes is after you have a privacy breach you know once the breach occurs and somebody like brent or or david gets involved um then the insurance company now is going to ask all sorts of questions after the breach well how did this happen mm -hmm. why did this happen what things did you have in place to prevent this from happening? Now, all of a sudden, your organization goes under a microscope. And the problem is, is once you go under the microscope, if the insurer doesn't see all the things that they would have expected to see, we're going, well, my goodness, you handle so much private information. You have health records, you have financial information, you have whatever. And it would have been reasonable or to assume 
that you would have taken at least these minimal measures to make sure that stuff was properly protected, but you didn't. Well, now the problem is you've been labeled as a bad risk and you could be deemed uninsurable. So now the next renewal comes up and they non-renew you. But the problem is we have to disclose that information to any other insurance company that we approach and we got to tell the story and if the problem is the story might not be a very good story to tell and once you try and tell that story you could become uninsurable everywhere and that's a problem because you know uh, if you're a publicly traded company you almost have to have some level of cyber insurance to meet your governance requirements if you're a privately owned company maybe you have investors and now the 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 confidence of your investors are shattered in your company and you could also be in breach of contracts because cyber insurance is also one of those things that's required in a lot of contracts and agreements today and how are you going to explain to your customers that you can't meet that requirement because you're uninsurable and what ramification is that going to have going well you're uninsurable well why are you uninsurable now all the questions start and they go oh my goodness well are you a vendor that i want to work with <laughs> if you're uninsurable <laughs> Um, and now that I know that you had a big loss uh, or, you know, a big incident that happened. So it's just kind of a cascading list of problems that really occurs. But, you know, just to kind of go back a little bit to a previous point about, well, how do you make this important to an organization, you know, to they so that they really understand the importance of this? I, I think one of the things a lot of organizations don't do, which is probably something that Amelia does, is you got to quantify the risk. You know, and that's a really important thing to explain to the employees as well. I say, listen, if we have a privacy breach, that's this is reputational loss, you know, to our organization. This is what it could cost in sales. This is what could it cost in market cap if we're um, a publicly traded company. We could lose, you know, a couple of our large customers. This is going to mean layoffs. This could mean all these sorts of things. Like, this is the reality. If if, if an event like this happens, this is the reality. Quantify it in dollars. And then people start to put the pieces of the puzzle together and they go, okay, you're just not adding another training for the sake of training. Now I'm understanding why it's important. Just, you know, because people intuitively understand, well, why are you measuring my customer service, you know, score with, with customers? Well, because I intuitively know that if I have unhappy customers, we, we lose customers. Mm -hmm. so I, can, I can put the two things together. So I think for employees, you kind of have some privacy. You got to put the two things together as well. So quantifying the risk can be really valuable. Yeah. Um, I want to turn to, uh, to David uh, because there's, a, again, a segue here where I see that organizations that are lucky or unlucky enough to detect a breach, um, and we all know that most don't, but if they've managed to detect a breach, they have to then make a decision to report it to the insurance company. Then the, the breach coach is engaged and suddenly Brent or David are on the line helping with a variety of, uh, of things. Is it foremost on your mind, David, as you're speaking with a company that's been victimized, that depending on how you carry out that coaching role, that a stigma of negligence might be um, affixed to an organization that has had um, breaches and security failures, perhaps not just once, but perhaps multiple times. As, as a breach coach, do you, do you care about that or do you deal with the matter at hand or do you try to advise them on how to clean up their image as well? To what extent do you help with that when in fact an organization has been proven to compromise personal information and you know that if you didn't help in a specific way, this organization might be seen as uh, a company that compromises people's privacy. So um, it's funny because I, I try to start with empathy because I think it's one of the only crimes where immediately the gun is turned around on the organization, mm -hmm. right? If your house gets broken into, your neighbors don't say, oh my goodness, you're, you know, how could you let this happen, right? Nobody says that. If you have a privacy breach or a cybersecurity incident, you're very close to saying that. How could, how could you let this happen? So I try to start with a little bit of empathy. Now that empathy, of course, is reduced if, if, <laughs> if you know that breaches keep happening and maybe they haven't reacted to it. So um, I, I think you need to um, 
you need to have follow-up, right? Because we always say breaches, breaches can happen. You can be a victim of a sophisticated, you know, breach. You can have, you know, we mentioned employee turnover. People will, even if you have a 99% phishing, you know, uh, email success rate, a, you know, a percent is enough. So it's how you deal with it. And then what, what can you implement? So we were talking about senior leaders. We're really begging on them today. But if you have a situation where everybody in the organization, right, we say everybody's or, um, implemented MFA, and then you realize, well, except for the CEO, because that's inconvenient for a number of reasons, or nobody's allowed to use their Yahoo account to conduct company business. Well, except for, you know, um, our, our, uh, our executives, then you know that, well, okay, who's, who's taking it seriously and who isn't and, and who's the actual, you know, the, the, the actual, uh, uh, who's, who's, who's got the biggest risk profile. But I wanted to say one thing, <laughs> what Michael was to say, because I, I agree with what Michael was saying. I do want to stress the cultural aspect of it though. And I know we need to tell people about the, the, the monetary risks and what can happen and all the, you know, how it can hit a pocketbook. But I do think there's something to be said for culture and how, especially companies that deal in sensitive information or that have a lot of employees or whatever it might be to enhance their risk profile, compliance and privacy can't be seen as a buzzkill. It has to be, you know, you got to move from buzzkill to, to sort of a coolness factor. Um, when it comes to privacy. And I think that's a big cultural lift, but that has to happen, at least for some companies. Mm -hmm. uh, Amalia, what are your thoughts on, um, sorry, Brent, were you going to say something? I was just going to pile on, on on that with David and say one of the pieces of advice I often give, because we see this all the time, and it got worse in remote deployment uh, over COVID, is if you... The, the line that IT always has to walk is if I make it inconvenient for people to do their jobs, they will find workarounds, they'll use their own devices, they will work on stuff on a home computer and email it to themselves, uh, like they, they'll, they'll find workarounds. So part of this is making sure that that's not happening, but you also have to give them the tools to do their jobs efficiently because their instinct is going to be to make their lives easier, not harder. And if all you're doing is saying no. Um, and, and rather than finding solutions to that problem, uh, you're going to have a leak. You'll, you'll be leaking like a sieve and you may or may, may or may not even know it. Exactly. Um, there's, there's a lot of gray areas in the space. And Amalia, I wanted to talk to you about this. And just as we're closing point number three here, to what extent do you think there should be tolerance when we hear that an organization that perhaps had fairly weak controls um, has been hit by a sophisticated attack. I, I, that, that word was used recently. Should there be tolerance for that? Or perhaps that, that tolerance should only happen the first time they're hit, but you know, if it happens over and over again, then maybe it's not sophistication and it points in fact to incompetence. Um, how how does that should that matter given that people's personal information has been compromised yeah so um let's it's it's good now that we can take some examples uh i i always like to talk to my students and one of the things that probably um got missed in the intro that uh, we have a program at university of toronto school of continuing studies to actually teach people to become privacy specialists and chief privacy officers and we do we talk a lot about examples and you know what is the privacy risk how what could have been done and one of my previous speakers said you know uh, you, you know the if if you get a regulator to assess you or some auditor they're going to look at how much training you've done and whatnot but uh an auditor or an, an sorry a regulator if you get hit they will look at uh, what you promised on your in your policies or in your web, uh, website uh, privacy notice or statement and then they're going to go inside your company and go i need to find all of these components and when a company has weak controls or or weak implementation of those maybe they have state of the art policies but they have not implemented them, it's going to be uh, very easily visible. And, and um, uh, 
um, they, they won't be able to explain those things. Um, I like to take the OPM breach. I always like to go back to that um, Office of Personnel Management. I mean, we got to look at what was at stake. I mean, how Tell us a bit they? about that one. Can you, can you refresh our memory? Well, Office of Personnel Management is the uh, org agency in the United States that keeps evidence of all the personnel, uh, their passports, their family, like anyone that has to come into the United States, that's where the data sits. It's there also their secret, whoever has secret of clearance or whatever you have, that's the institution. And they got hit with a massive breach. And, and you know, I don't think it was enough of like, what, why are these people in management positions? How come this went past them? Like, I, I think that we have to look at what is at stake, the kind of information. And that is, uh, has repercussions in all the countries. Because if I was a government employee that was sent to the United States on some sort of project mission, that my papers and all they know about me would be in that, in their databases. So it's the entire world's <laughs> personnel got hit at the same time. So does anyone think that what happened at the uh, OPM, uh, the, the types of failures, the absence of safeguards, and the absence of uh, controls in the form of, of awareness and vigilance, um, does anyone think that that's, a, that that's a, an exception? Uh, or is that more likely to be the norm. It's just it hasn't uh, culminated in as vast a breach. Brent, you were going to add I, your two cents. I, I, a breach as catastrophic, as catastrophic and inexplicable as that one? No, we've mm -hmm. seen a bunch of them, and we've seen some in Canada. Uh, the difference between that one and some of the ones we've seen against our own government is that we don't have spies posted at foreign embassies whose cover was blown by any of those breaches, which is the scenario you have in the case that Amalia is talking about. Mm -hmm. So, yep. but no, we've had, um, we've had attacks by uh, China on uh, government agencies that sit on a lot of intellectual property that's being developed. Uh, we've had attacks on CRA uh, and no, we see this regularly and I'm not frankly confident that any organization in the country is entirely set up uh, well enough to repel, let's say, like a really, uh, a really determined uh, state sponsored attack. Uh, no. So uh, yeah, my, my worry is that it's the norm rather than the exception. And it's mm -hmm. just a question of who's next, not to fear monger or anything. <laughs> so speaking of who's next, uh, we've got one minute for each of you to give us a uh, up to one minute uh, summary of what you think is the one thing that organizations can do to improve their training, awareness, uh, vigilance, um, reporting, and, and really the, the empowerment of employees when it comes to the protection of personal information. Um, David. So um, you asked for one thing, I'm not sure I'll-, I'll... Or, or just a one minute uh, yeah, stream of so... consciousness. <laughs> So I would say, um, and I think we've mentioned this word before, but training has to be meaningful and it can't just be when we're talking about um, protecting personal information, protecting the business, it cannot just be focused on cybersecurity. It can't just be a training about phishing. It has to be more meaningful than that. It has to get into what is personal information? Why do we care? Why do we care about personal information that might be public already? It's, it's that kind of thing that we need to, um, that, that um, privacy training or cybersecurity training needs, needs to address. And it has to be, uh, organizationally, there has to be a culture that starts, you know, we always say, um, lead from the top, the mood in the middle, uh, middle management has to champion that as well. Um, in order for the training to be to be meaningful, and then you need a program around it. I think that's that's where organizations should strive to go. It's not easy, but that should that should be the goal. 